Hey everyone, and welcome back to the channel. In this video, we'll be solving an AP Microeconomics FRQ from last year's AP Microeconomics exam. With that said, let's get into it. So today we'll be looking at an AP Microeconomics short answer question, and it's out of five marks total, but the average score on this was 2.22 out of five. So a lot of people did pretty poorly on this question, and I'm going to show you in this exact example how to get a perfect five out of five score on this question. So if you see any questions like this, you're gonna be able to solve it step by step and see exactly what the examiner is looking for. Now, without further ado, let's actually look at what the question is asking us. So if you wrote the AP Microeconomics test last year, maybe you recognize this question. So this is question two of the FRQs, and it says good X is produced and sold in a perfectly competitive market. The provided graph shows the market for good X. And so here we have a graph and you'll see there's actually three curves on it. There's two benefit curves and there's one cost curve. So immediately this tells me it's an externality problem. And I can tell because there's a social benefit and a private benefit and they're not the same. So I know there's an externality. And in this case, I know it's a positive externality, but we'll get to that later in the video. Let's start by solving question A. And question A is pretty simple. And question A says to identify the market equilibrium price and quantity. And so the first thing I need to do is see what kind of market it is. And the question tells me it's a perfectly competitive market. So in order to find the equilibrium, I'm going to look at the private cost curve, which is right here, the marginal private cost curve, which I've highlighted in blue. And I'm gonna see where it intersects the marginal private benefit curve. And I've highlighted that in red. So these are the private curves, and this is what the firms would do when they're trying to find that equilibrium price and quantity. So it's simple from here, now that I've set MPC equal to MPB, I'm just gonna see where they intersect and you can see very clearly it's at $15 and a quantity of 300. So for that full mark, I need to state this and I need to say the market equilibrium price is $15 and the quantity is 300 units. And if I said all of these things, then there's my first point, nice and easy. Now the second part, part B, says to calculate the deadweight loss at the market equilibrium and more importantly, show your work. So if there's a deadweight loss at the market equilibrium, it means I'm not at the optimal value when I'm in equilibrium. So let's take a look at our equilibrium that we found in question A, where the marginal private benefit intersected with the marginal private cost. That's the market equilibrium. But if I want to know the socially optimal point, then I need to look at the marginal social cost, which in this case is the same curve as the marginal private cost. So it's still the blue line but I need to see where the marginal social cost intersects with the marginal social benefit. And that's this orange line right here. And that point where I have those two lines intersect is my optimal point. And it's actually to the right of the original market equilibrium that we found in part A. And we have a deadweight loss that's occurring because we're consuming at 300 units and a price of 15 instead of that new equilibrium point. And the deadweight loss triangle can be denoted right here. A little fun fact for you guys, if you're unsure where the deadweight loss triangle occurs, it's always an arrow which points left or right towards the optimal equilibrium value. So in this case, the market equilibrium is not optimal, but that new equilibrium point where the marginal social cost and the marginal social benefit intersect is, and you'll see that yellow triangle is actually pointing towards it. So that's a little fun fact if you're unsure where that triangle is. And now all I need to do is show my work. So I wanna solve for that deadweight loss triangle. And of course the area of a triangle is just deadweight loss in this case is equal to one half times base times height. And the base and the height are right here. So I'm gonna substitute those values into my equation. So deadweight loss is equal to one half 25 minus 15. That's the base of my triangle times 400 minus 300, which is the height of my triangle. If I simplify this, I simply get deadweight loss is equal to one half times 10 times 100. Simplifying further, I get deadweight loss is equal to half of 1,000. And then finally, with some very simple arithmetic, deadweight loss is equal to $500. And so since I've shown my work, I will get one point for doing all of this in solving for deadweight loss. Now let's take a look at part C. So again, I've showed my work for deadweight loss. So I'm gonna put it down here and we're gonna solve for C. And it says that suppose the government wants to eliminate the deadweight loss in the market for good X which of the following will achieve the government's objective? A per unit tax on consumers or a per unit subsidy to consumers? Explain. And in order to answer this question, we need to establish if this is a positive or a negative consumption externality. And we can do that by comparing the marginal private benefits curve 
which is the demand curve and the marginal social benefit. So the marginal private benefit is to the left of the marginal social benefit. And so we would read this as the marginal social benefit is higher than the marginal private benefit, which means there's actually more good to society than is being internalized or realized in the economy at the original equilibrium here. And so we should be operating at the social optimum, which is up here. And so we would say this is a positive consumption externality, and therefore we would want to incentivize people to spend more. We want to actually get to that top intersection where the marginal social benefit and the marginal social cost curves intersect rather than remaining at the original equilibrium from part A. And so then you have to ask yourself, which of these is going to incentivize consumers to spend more? A tax, which is going to raise their cost, or a subsidy, which is essentially a negative tax and it's going to lower their cost. Well, naturally, if you want people to spend more money, then you should subsidize their spending. And in this case, a per unit subsidy is going to achieve the government's objective. However, that's not all we have to do. We can't just say it's a per unit subsidy for consumers and that's that. We will not get full marks. We want to go from marginal private benefit to the right or increased to marginal social cost. And we need to explain why a per unit subsidy to consumers will do that. And there's actually three different possible ways that you can explain this. So let's take a look at three possible answers, any of which will give you full marks. Okay, so the first explanation is a per unit subsidy to consumers that internalizes external benefits, increases the incentive and ability of consumers to buy at the socially optimal quantity of 400 units. What this means is that if you give people some amount of money, then they can internalize that benefit and they can experience that benefit themselves, which will then encourage them to consume more. How much more? Well, enough to get them from that original quantity of 300 to the new quantity that we're looking for at 400. Another alternative explanation you could have given is a per unit subsidy to consumers equal to the marginal external benefit, which is the difference between those two curves, increases consumption to the socially optimum quantity of 400 units by lowering the price paid by consumers. So you might look at it and say, oh, well, consumers don't want to consume 400 units because it goes with a price of $20 and they don't want to pay that. So if you subsidize it, if the government gives consumers money, then they're going to be able to afford to consume more of those units and they won't be held back because it will lower the price that the consumers have to pay. And the final explanation, the explanation I personally would use is this, a per unit subsidy to consumers equal to the difference between the two curves, the marginal social benefit and the marginal private benefit, increases the quantity exchanged to the socially optimal quantity of 400 units. And what this means is that if you give the consumers the exact amount between the curves, then essentially you will bridge the gap between the two curves. You will move the marginal private benefit curve to the marginal social benefit curve. So if you answered any of these, that's gonna give you a full mark and you'll now have three points. However, you can also score another point in part C when you look at part two. And part two is asking what is the dollar value of the per unit tax or per unit subsidy identified in part C one. So in this case, we know that it's a per unit subsidy. We just explained it. As you can see, it's on the screen right now. Now we need to find the per dollar amount. And to be honest, this should be a free mark for you guys. It's just the difference between the marginal private benefit curve and the marginal social benefit curve. In fact, look at our answer for part C1. That's exactly what it says. Now don't fall into the trap that many students do. And that's where they look at the difference between the two equilibrium points and they say, oh, well, I go from a price of 15 to a price of 20, therefore it's a difference of five. That's not true. You don't look at the diagonal distance, you actually look at the vertical distance between the two points. So if you take any point on the original red line, the marginal private benefit, how much do you have to increase the price by to get to the marginal social benefit? And if you do that and you look at any points on those lines, you'll see that they're exactly $10 apart and so the dollar value that I would need to give consumers in order for them to consume at that marginal social benefit um, curve instead would be exactly $10. So the dollar value of the per unit subsidy is $10. And if you said that, you get another point. Finally, we've got four out of five points. We need that final one from part D. 
Part D says, suppose the government imposes a price ceiling at $10. Will the price ceiling achieve the socially optimal quantity of good X? Explain. So here we're looking at that price ceiling of $10 and the best way to visualize this is simply to draw it. Like there's no harm in drawing on your graph when you're writing that test. So go ahead and draw your price ceiling at $10 and here you're gonna see the intersection in two different spots. You're gonna see that it intersects the marginal private cost curve at 200 and it intersects the marginal private benefit at 400. So theoretically, if the price was $10, then the demand would be 400. But we know that this is actually going to cause a shortage. And it's because even though there's a demand of 400, there's only a supply of 200. Whenever we have a price ceiling, if it's binding, it's going to lead to a shortage. And therefore we have more demand than we have supply. And so the amount traded in the economy is actually going to be limited by the supply. Now, again, the question asks you to explain. So to get those full marks, you must do that. And here's an explanation that would give you full marks. No, the price ceiling will not achieve the socially optimal quantity of good X because the price ceiling will cause the quantity exchanged in the market, which is limited by the quantity supplied of 200, to be less than the socially optimal quantity of 400. So again, you can see that when we have a price ceiling at $10, we've got two things happening. It intersects the supply curve or the marginal private cost curve at 200 and the marginal private benefit or the demand curve at 400. And we are going to be restrained by that left-hand side or the short side of the market. And that amount, the smaller of the two, is what's actually traded in the economy. So no, that is not gonna be 400, it will be 200 units. And so if you said these things, you will find your last point. Now on screen, you have a perfect solution, five out of five points for one of the questions that most people got less than 50% on. If you have an externality question in front of you, you can kind of use this to model what a complete answer would look like. I'm going to link this test question and the AP solutions in the description. So if you're interested in looking at some of the old tests, the College Board makes all of that available to you. So please feel free to check them out. Again, I will link them in the description so you can check them out yourself. We hope that you found this video helpful. And if you did, let us know by liking the video, subscribing to the channel, and of course, let us know in the comments section what sort of economic topics or homework questions you'd like to see us cover in the future. Thanks for watching this video, and we'll catch you in the next.